get into the subject. Welcome back to another episode of On the Subject. I'm your host, Michael Villardo, co-founder and CEO of Subject, subject subject.com. And remember, click and like Spotify and YouTube links because today we have an incredibly special guest. This is an old dear friend who we haven't actually been in person together in 13 years. So it's an especially exciting raw conversation. This is a former first round NHL draft pick, an incredible comedian, podcast host, entrepreneur, uh, fashion designer. Notice the butter golf hat if you're watching this on video and inspiration and cultural influencer, hence why I have sunglasses on to match him today, Jordan Schmaltz, also known as Jay Swish, also known as the People's Champ, People's Insider. How are you doing today? Welcome to the show. Well, Mikey V, it's good to see you, by the way, first of all. And secondly, jack of all trades, master of none, right? Yeah. So that's who I am over here as the People's Insider. I do have my baseball gloves. I love the gloves. I know you were a baseball player, yes, so I do have the mitts on. I came prepared. I'm fresh off the bird in terms of getting right off the tarmac of LAX. But no, man, it's good to see you. I think the first time I ever actually met you or heard of you, we were playing on the LA or sorry, the Illinois AAA hockey circuit. Correct. And you were a year older than me, but you Correct. were playing U16 at the time. Yep. And I think I've been playing U16. Right. I don't know if I was playing up or maybe you would just spend an extra year playing U16 because you wanted to dominate. <laughs> and I was looking at this guy. He used to wear white gloves. And if you wore white gloves in hockey, you had to be a player, which Mike was. But they were a little flashy or, or, or cocky at the yeah, time. They were. And not only did you have that, but you had the half welding shield, you have the half <laughs> bubble, half cage. So you had the hybrid mask. Absolutely. Man, you, you were swagging out then, even back in the day, 15, 16 years ago. It was hilarious. And I had, uh, not thinking about me, I also had the white skates. You did have the white I skates. White I was like, skates. who is this guy? Like, Which was better. very bold, I right. agree. So, yeah, I know the, the first time I met Jordan, yeah. So he was one of the earliest commits in the country. At 14 years old, he committed to the University of Wisconsin. And he's from Verona, Wisconsin originally. So he's right down the street from Madison. Uh, committed superstar potential everyone knew who he was like he said i in hockey it goes by birth year i was 92 you're 93 you're both playing you 16 it was your first year it was my second year you're exactly right i wanted to dominate i I thought i was going to play base which i ended up going back to uh so i was just playing hockey for fun that year and it ended up being a much better year than anticipated but basically jordan and i we played on two different teams together chicago mission for two games i only played two games on the team and then i got called up to the development team and then this is the last time we've actually communicated face to face is February of 2010 in Slovakia, we were with the USA uh, national development team. Jordan was playing a tournament with us, uh, and we had a great time. Then we did play one other time against each other. You were on the Green Bay Gamblers. This year you won first round in the NHL draft. We didn't really talk because I was on the steal, and we weren't, like, interacting much. But it's been 13 years since we've had a conversation face-to-face. You've had so much life since then. I absolutely love what you're doing. I think that you're going to have such an incredible career as a broadcaster, but – I definitely want to rewind some of it because we have to catch up and we got to catch up for all the fans on here. You know, what is it like now? You're 30 years old. And last time I saw you, you were barely 16. Yeah, well, what is old is kind of new again, right? I've always 30 thought, years young. You know, my apologies. Like, yeah, like yeah. a fine wine yeah, over yeah, here, yeah, folks. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I mean, I'm still a guy wearing baseball gloves as a 30 year old. And I think you could attest to this, Mike, is I've always been that guy in the locker room. Always, yeah. That would have the one liners, hopefully dialed in for the fellas, trying to come up with the next joke and then get on the ice and, and trying to ball out. But yeah, man, it's been a, a little bit of a transition in terms of, you know, coming out of eight or nine years of pro hockey. You kind of get out of that space and you realize the world's probably a little bit bigger than you thought because you're so, just much bigger. so focused on your craft, um, your Robert craft, if you will. <laughs> There's a little one liner. But yeah, man, it's it's been fun. It's been I've been dipping my toes in, you know, kind of all spaces of fashion with, uh, you know, even breaking trades this year, beating the insiders at their own job at some times. And, oh, I love it. And, you know, st- still, still trying to stay around hockey, but at the same time kind of branch out and, and see what I like to do. And like you said, ultimately, I would love to get into the broadcasting space and kind of do it in my way where I think there's going to be different avenues to watch games for people to get their content where it's not necessarily just kind of buttoned up and, um, you know, the traditional way of doing it. It's maybe, you know, four or five buttons down and i might be even showing some nipples too yeah i, I love a little bit more explicit and, and different things like that so yeah man it's it's been a lot well, of you fun. did broadcast this year a couple games for north dakota correct? yeah i did what uh, tv network was that it was uh midco sports so it was shout out on midco way to give this guy the opportunity this guy yes. is the next and more progressive raw version of biz nasty and by the way we actually uh my wife and i met 
Biz Nasty at Chaconi's down the street here. Okay. Yeah. And so now he follows after the show. I'm definitely going to send a picture of the two yeah. of us to him. But I really think you're going to even elevate his space because you're willing to go places that he's not even willing to go. Yeah, I'll go into the dark alley, yeah. right? I'll, I'll show up to a, a gunfight with a knife. And, and I'll be all prepared to get out there and get out of that corner. But, yeah, man, it's, it's been a lot of fun. I just think in hockey, as you know, and even in all sports, you see with the NBA, I think they're always the trendsetters and the tone setters in terms of really pushing the envelope. But I think in hockey, you just need more people that can articulate the game in a raw, uncut way, but also know the sport and are knowledgeable. And that's kind of what I try to bring where, you know, I can I can swear or I can talk about, you know, maybe a chick I had over the night before. But then back to the play. <laughs> Sorry, we got a little sidetracked, but that's what me and my buddy, the Heat Daddy, who's on Twitter. So yeah, can to, you please to find Robbie a way Gucci. to get, can you get Heat Daddy to come on the show? We're a huge fan of the Heat Daddy. We just watched, by the way, everyone go check out on YouTube, the Camelback Open. Yep. Unbelievable comedy. This is Heat Daddy Bobby Gucci. Again, never met the guy. Huge yep. fan from afar. And Jay Swish, Jordan Schmaltz. They are a dynamic duo, and they host Hockey Night in Scottsdale. Not to be a mistake with Hockey Night in Canada, the much funnier original version. How did you guys come up with such great ideas? Comedic Honestly, geniuses. Yeah, like I, I've known the Heat Daddy forever. And actually, we're editing our second episode. Right I saw now. that today. Florida. It's a Florida it's episode. It's a Florida gone wild where we were just in the we were in the swamps of Florida, the Everglades, like fishing out gators, doing some pretty fucked up shit. Was YP with you? Yeah, he was. Yeah, so young that, paid views. Yeah, so he was kind of the guy steering the ship in terms of getting these <laughs> crocodile hunters, the guys with the airboats. So shout out to YP. He did a good job on that. But we're editing that right now. But the way we kind of met actually goes back to – when I was playing junior hockey, when Twitter, which is now X, came out, I would always DM this guy. like cause he, Heat I, Daddy. I, I and that like was when he had the Danny Heatley avatar yes, picture, right? I felt yeah. like we always had similar kind of lingo, yeah. the way he talked and the you know what I was saying maybe in the locker room kind of just jived or whatever. So you fast forward to I, I bought a place in Scottsdale in 2019. He has been down there ever since his ASU club hockey days. Yeah, nice. So if you're out in Scottsdale seven days a week, there's a good chance Heat Daddy's out eight. Right, because he's going to be doing a day night double. It's always does one that those last days. one of the night picture, but yeah. it's like the first one of the exactly. night. Exactly. So we met, you know, I think it was at a place like Boondocks or somewhere in Old Town, and one thing kind of led to another. I was going to be done playing, and, and it kind of escalated to a point where we're like, we should do something together. And what that looks like was a spinoff of like a Eli Manning cast, where obviously we weren't able to show the game because we don't have the TV rights. But if we could sit in front and watch one game a week, where Hockey Night in Scott yep. still did live streams. I think we could articulate the game and, and give people a play-by-play -play they would really like. That kind of got parlayed into doing some live shows this year where we were selling tickets. Our last live show in Edmonton and Buffalo, I think we sold over you know, 200, 250 tickets. So, so cool. We plan on hitting the road where it's this comedy slash hockey talk slash whatever the fuck goes on. Let's get off the rails. Let's play some flip cup up there. Maybe show them someone in the stands might flash their tits. I don't know what's going to happen, but we want to bring that side of the game to things. And um, the people seem to really be liking it. Man. Yeah, I love the intro that the two you had in the Calgary green room walking out. Yes. Like, that looked like straight out of WWE. Yeah. Such incredible artistic style. Uh, I assume you're not coming to uh, – I was really excited hoping you would come to L.A., but I assume not just because it's not as big of a hockey market. Or, like, what's next for the, you guys? Like, where do you want to tour I next year? So. I, I think so. I think we'll, you could come to I L.A. and make it come, happen. I yeah. think we could come here. I think we could maybe go down to, like, Newport Beach, get yeah. to the, the chin of the beach over there. I think for us, though, we got to conquer, like, it's more so, like, I think, like, the model I always tell Heat Daddy, and we kind of agree on this, is, like, trying to be a, a – like a big fish in a small pond to start, right? Yeah, so no, smart. We, you got to be niche. It's just like startups. If, you have to focus yes. on a niche. So if we can get in these smaller markets, whether it's colleges, juniors, yes. we can have these fans. That'll develop our cult following. Yep. Where we have these kids from 18 or 16 years old to, to all the way up, right? So I think we need to mesh that with along with doing some NHL cities, Canada obviously being yeah, the biggest hockey. market. But I think we can really get into these some of these you know, WHL cities, Western yes. Hockey League, or Ontario Hockey League cities, and, and go in there, do some stuff maybe with the team, do a show before, and kind of just go in there and just... I love your focus. Up. You have some really great business sense, and that's what we always talk about, too, when you're building companies. Like, you have to have a long-term vision, which is very clear you do, because you're already talking about cult following. That takes years to progress, but the yep. dedication of the long-term vision, it's very transcendent. What, what about... So you have the Hockey Night in Scottsdale with Heat yep. Daddy... And then you also have Live and Five with Gage Osmus. Yep. Shout out Gage. I uh, don't know him personally, but again, another huge yep. fan. 
how do you manage both as an entrepreneur plus butter golf? So you have a lot going on right now. On. Most days, yeah. like here, they're long. They're like you. I always see yeah. you posting like you got to get the edge, whether it's in the morning or yeah, at it's got to work every day, seven days a week. I'm a Bob Seeger type of guy. I'm a night move. Yeah. So I like, I like, I like to work yeah, in the yeah. night. You know, yeah, yeah. Three o'clock when someone's, you know, I know they're sleeping. I'm, I'm getting yes. the edge that way. Yes. But it's, it's cool to see. I just wanted to touch on like the cult following. I think it's funny. And I'm getting into this space now where I, I can see it's actually working. Again, I don't have like a crazy big following. I really don't. But I, I can see where, solid following. I can I'm, see where it's going to go. Yes. We were in Chicago last week or two weeks ago uh, before a Cubs game sitting at Sluggers. Yes. The bar that has the batting gloves. I saw you swing in a bit. Yeah. That's why I have my batting gloves because that was the last time I used them. They were my bag. Oh, nice. So we went up there before the game. It was my sister, my brother. And my dad and the, oh Nick and Kylie were with you yeah and Nick's okay. gal and the reason why I could see was like I have that cult following coming is because there's probably like five or six kids that came up to me like Swiss yo fella chin tuck they're saying all these yeah. words to me meanwhile we got a guy that's a point per game NHL player Nick here they're asking him like hey can you take a picture of us I'm like what's going on you know like I was a seven eighth defenseman in the NHL and a, a decent minor league player but it was just so funny because. Man, that's what it's about is you go back to it's like is building your brand. And, and I see it all the time, especially with Heat Daddy in Canada. It's like, man, you get that cult following. These people, are, it's like Jordan Belford and Wolf of Wall Street. They'll start, you know, they'll start get going for you. So it's it's cool. And you know what I mean? At the end of the day, I just I love making people laugh. I love that. And you you have a superpower with that. We actually have someone who works at our company who worked directly for Jordan Belfort. Yeah. He's an incredible salesperson. And his one of his grooms whom was Carter Belfort, his son. Okay. So he definitely hits home with that. And I, I like your perspective. And I think that's something really important. And, you know, we grew up playing hockey our whole life. And it was all of our dreams playing the NHL. And it's such a cool dream. You actually got to live out the dream. 42 games in the NHL. Jordan, first round pick. This guy was a complete superstar. But you realize now as you step out that, the world is much bigger than hockey, and you probably could impact more people from a happiness standpoint and from a, your you know own, own wealth standpoint, even out of the league, if you really take off. And that's what's so special about what you're doing, creating a career. Can you talk more about your decision to end up at NODAC, North Dakota? This is the top, arguably top program. I'm sure you'll say it is, but uh, universally considered a top three program in college hockey. And you were originally committed to Wisconsin. Like, how did you handle the pressure as a kid? Getting these scholarship offers, how did you decommit? You know, we just had Johnny Manziel on uh, yeah. a couple weeks ago. He talked about decommitting from Chip Kelly in Oregon and going to Texas A and M. How did you do that, Mike Ease with Wisconsin? I know and Eber was a scary bastard. He was too, very intense. So I was, I was 14 years old. I got that commitment. I was out of their summer camp they do for high school <laughs> yeah. kids, and they're like, you know, to a young fella, like, you want to commit? I'm like, fuck, sure. <laughs> KK State Street. Yeah, that's a great Madison. Decent, beautiful, some decent trim around, walking around here. Why not? I mean, I, I haven't gotten laid yet, but if I, if I do ever, this is a good chance that I could do, get it done here, right? So, that was my kind of thought, and they were great at the time. In 2010, they, had they just were? played in the national championship yes. game. They got whacked at Ford Field against Boston College. If you remember, I think it was seven one. But they had a good team. Mark Osiki ended up leaving, who developed all those defensemen. At Ohio State, right? Yeah, yeah. Justin Schultz, Jake Gardner, nice. Cody Golabev, Ryan McDonough, all these good elite first-round pick defensemen, and that's kind of what I was trending towards. And then they just went to shit, and I'm sitting there in Sioux City, Iowa, before the camp, and I'm 15 or 16 years old. I'm like, Jesus, this team, like last year, they're like 57th out of 59th in the pairwise. Oh, like, wow. I can't be wearing jumpsuits around here. They're not oh. even know who the hockey team is. Yep. And obviously, I have North Dakota roots with all my uncles yep. and my dad, football, right? dad playing football at North Dakota. So I think that's where I always wanted to go. And it worked out that way where Kerry Eads was, you know, kind of opened up my recruiting and I committed within a month. But it was funny that I remember that phone call. I was sitting at a one diamond days, days in outside of Sioux City, Iowa. <laughs> and I called Mike Eaves and I brought my buddy in there to hear the conversation. I was like, fuck, this is a good Who was well. this, Timmy O'Brien? or It was... Uh, Taylor Ward, actually. Yeah, Troy shout Ward. out, shout yeah, out, Taylor shout out to Ward. T. Ward. So he comes in the room with me, like, fella, like, I'm a little nervous right now. Like, I'm 15. I'm going to decommit from this school. I need you there just for some, you know, emotional support. So I yeah. call him. I put him on speakerphone. Yep. And he starts, you know, giving me the business. Like, what the fuck are you thinking? I'm like, fuck. I'm thinking in my head, fuck, you guys suck. <laughs> you know? like, but I can't say that. I'm like, yeah, like, I just had to change of hearts. I'm not going to go here. And I just remember, I don't know how long the conversation lasted. It couldn't have been more than three minutes. But I remember he just hung up on me. He was like, fuck you. I'm like, Wow, to a kid. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He said, fuck you. And I, I remember that. I'm like, oh, man, let's go. When I fucking play these guys, I'm never losing to them. And you know what? We never lost. I think we were 4-0-1 against Wisco. So oh, I love that. Let's Took go. Took him to the cleaners. Yeah, and I mean, you're very loyal to Nodak. Look, your shoes are green. Your yep. hat's green. 
your co-host Gage Osmus, he went to North Dakota. Yep, captain. Yeah, Captain, yeah. Actually, uh, still a short story time for Vernier, one of our early investors and early employees, uh, Jimmy DeVito, great guy, mutual friend of ours. He told a story of when he was at RPI, he was the captain, and he played yep. North Dakota. You were probably in the NHL or AHL at that point. And Gage was the captain, and at the after the handshakes, like, hey, you know, meet us at our hockey house after, and like invited yeah. him to a party. That's pretty good hospitality. Is that a North Dakota thing, or? Yeah, it is, and it, I think so. I mean, we had some hardos on our team. I was just like thinking about that, like one year we had, so we we absolutely whacked Miami one year. We Miami whacked, Ohio, they had, like, yeah, they had, like Austin Zarnick, some of these guys, yeah, guys pretty great. good team. Yes. But we whacked them Friday night, like five one, and I think the next night on Saturday was seven one. So we invited these guys, like we do. You know, they're going to stay over the night. They don't have the charter birds out of there like North Dakota, the luxury we did. But So they stay Saturday night. They come over to the hockey house. We play them in flip cup. We beat them 4 nothing. It was Nodak versus Miami. We had the whole party, including the guys on Miami. I've told the story before, chanting, fuck Miami. So then we had them all in there. And then what we do after we roasted them 4 nothing in a best of seven, we kicked them out of the party. He said, boys, <laughs> you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. So <laughs> I don't know why we did that, but that was that's kind of – but normally, yeah, we would, those guys, especially non-conference, they would come over and – and party and hang out with us at the pita pit we call it well in north dakota is a very uh incredible culture rich hockey history and it seems like you all are really good friends here yep. and this this podcast is all about positivity so i hope this isn't taken the wrong way uh, how did uh you know mutual teammate of ours i wouldn't call it very close with us anymore but rocco grimaldi fit in with that crew it doesn't seem like yeah it, it doesn't seem like it's fully aligned to yeah he, he you know you're right <laughs> and he's a super nice guy and like i actually drove him to practice all the time when i was yes. on the development team and uh you know he's he was one of the best youth hockey players of all time but just interesting because when i know all the other north dakota guys i know it doesn't seem like there's as much of a match but yeah, yeah. no he uh because he was the same class well, year or is one class above he was you? one class above but he redshirted so oh I yeah went, he did redshirt so yeah. rocco was a 93 same yeah. year as me but well, you're a late birthday, a late yeah, birthday yeah. so i mean my nickname for him was always baby jesus <laughs> he loved that because he was you know a very christian no, man. He was very religious but yeah it was funny like he he didn't live with any of the fellas on the team like he had his own buddies and probably rightfully so <laughs> what we were getting up to but i just could not um, see him no yeah like he was ball, always yeah. but he was a good pro he's at the such rink. a good guy yeah, he yeah. was a good pro at the rink where he probably lacked in the social aspect he made up for on the ice and, and always brought a good attitude and you know that was a guy that would be in the gym doing his own workouts late at night or, or getting oh, on the ice before or like a very competitive guy but yeah, if you're talking about a guy you need a beer pong partner for, he's probably not your first call, you know. <laughs> no, because I'm gonna be drinking all the beers, and he can't even really shoot that well. So now I'm twice as drunk, and I got a guy that doesn't exactly have a mid-range game like Sean Livingston. Yeah, you know. No, that makes more sense. But you did have the lucky opportunity to get to play with your brother for one season at yep. North Dakota, which yep. is so cool. You know, I always talk about for myself, not nearly on the level of you, but I played high school baseball one year with my brother. I was a senior. He was a sophomore, so similar dynamic. And that still to this day is one of my fondest memories. Talk about that. And then you did leave, and then they won the national championship the oh, next year, right? So, like, well, dagger. I know you you did want to win. I mean, you, you were first-round picks. So you are probably like, let me get the money. But, like, talk about that decision, too, and how that affected you. Yeah, it was tough. I mean, our team, I thought the year before and – the previous year, we lost in the semifinals yeah. of the Frozen Four. So we were right there. The Minnesota game, the point six second game, that famous game, and then BU just took us to the screws a little bit in Boston the next year. And I, I thought we had the team, especially with Nick, you know, the, the following year probably going to be, you know, a more elevated role. He'd be a sophomore. He's really going to take off Brock Besser coming in. The CBS line. Yeah, but you know how it is. If you're a first-round pick, these teams are telling you, go. you yep. hey, you're going to be in the lineup next year. And I, I wish I just would have – had a little bit more perspective from maybe an outsider or an agent and been looked like, hey, fella, look at their lineup right now. Yeah. Petrangelo on the right side. Shattenkirk. They have Pareko coming in at the same year. Yep. They didn't know he was going to be that, but, I mean, guys like Ivan Drogba. Yeah, he's six, amazing. Six, yeah. And they also had Robert Portuzo. So maybe – if I would have stayed four years, who knows if I would have won? I mean, it would have been great to and win. You could have been an unrestricted, but unrestricted free agent. Free agent. Well, so, you are off the ice, too. Yeah, right. right. So hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? But, yeah, that did sting. But I was happy for those guys, right? Those are all my Oh, of all, course. All I mean, fellas, it's your brother. It does suck that, um, you know, they, they're they going to have these reunions, and I'm going to be like, fuck, you guys need a driver for the weekend? You know, I'll just come up and party. But, yeah, it, uh, 
Yeah, it was it was tough. Just like you're sitting in the AHL at the time too, right? And what was the AHL team? San Antonio it was, Rampage. It was or? Chicago. At Chicago the time. Wolves. So I'm I'm at my two bedroom stabbing cabin in Palatine, Illinois. Wait, Washington. you lived in Palatine? Yeah, because the the practice rink was uh just up like it was. What up West Meadows? Like, yeah, no, it was uh like Schaumburg, north of Schaumburg. Not Barrington. I'm gonna say it's yeah, 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 yeah. So we would practice there. So I, we were living in Palatine at the time, and I'm watching. Where did you go to Dirty Nellies ever? Or? Yeah, we go there during the Nellies a little bit, a little live music. But, yeah, I'm sitting there. I'm, like, drinking, you know, boxed wine on an AHL salary. Like, Jesus, fuck. It's going to be about another two-month bender up there for those boys. And I'm playing game 68 against Rockford on a Sunday, and it's dressed like a seat night. You know? <laughs> it's you, your agent, and a gremlin in the stands. It's like, oh, this isn't perfect. But, yeah, it, you know, I, I wouldn't have changed a thing. You know, sign pro, go in there. And, and No, and I think, well, I'd love to talk more about is the fact that so Jordan and his brother Nick Schmaltz, who's an incredible player, like he said, point-per-game NHL guy, these are two kids from the same family who both went in the first round of the NHL draft. And they, to you know, all your listeners, they, these kids were so committed, they were driving about two hours one way to practice starting at what age? Yeah, I think our my, how fast did you get it down, dude? Two hours is pretty yeah, accurate, it was like right? two and change. Yeah, when, they, when they went down, it went from to Ad, Woodridge, Addison yeah. to Woodridge. Yeah, I think my first year at the mission was maybe Pee Wee Major, and then so, Nick's was which year? Similar to that, so I think it was like in total, it was probably like six or seven years. So, ago. what was that decision like? From and obviously, again, two first round picks, unbelievable. Like, how did your family make that decision? Um, was it mostly your dad driving? Did your mom also contribute? Like, how what yeah. was the family dynamic there? Because, like, that's an intense commitment. But, again, two first-round picks from Verona, Wisconsin. This is a really, really special story. Yeah, shout-out to Verona, too. Verona. 10,000 people yeah. it is. Oh, that's hometown USA. But, yeah, it was uh... – my dad had a little bit more flexibility just being an entrepreneur himself, owning gyms. I heard and, on your last video about the gym. Yeah. Uh, when we could get back to that later. Yeah, so he, had, so he had some. He had the gyms going, and you know he could get up early to work and then drive us. But a lot of the times, my mom would either drive one day a week, so it would probably be a Thursday. She would get out of the hospital. She was a radiologist. Very so cool. She would grind during the day, and then my dad would pick us up from school. We'd skip like six and seventh hour and just say, "Hey, just give us study hall or whatever. We don't need. I mean, who cares? Let's get out of here." I know this is a <laughs> no, 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 no. Podcast. we'll circle back to that. I didn't exactly go to Harvard or the West, so <laughs> we would get out of school and you know we'd have like noodles and company or Chipotle oh, wait for stuff, us, yes. and then we would do a little handoff at the hospital because it was on the way or the clinic was out, you know, kind of on the off way of ninety. Yeah, it was on the way out of town, at least for us from Verona. So we would you know get dropped off there once a week with my mom. She would drive us down, but. The, the dumb thing at the time is, like, the missions, like, a couple of years, they wouldn't really coordinate, like, the practice times. Well, between the 96 and 93. So sometimes it would be, like, 5 o'clock practice, and then, you know, the U16 or 18s would be practicing, like, 10 at night. So some of those nights, we're getting home at, like, 2 in the morning. Oh, my And goodness. then we were going to school the next day, and you're just foggy as hell, you know. Yeah. And you're, like, in, sitting there in biology, and they're asking me a question. I'm like, no, not right now. But, yeah, man, I mean, that's kind of what it takes. And I think, honestly – more of the effort at the time was was from the parents and i don't think yeah. we could ever really repay them other than you know i always try to tell them you know that that was crazy that you guys did that for that long and then i had a sister that pl ended up playing volleyball at kentucky so she was doing travel yeah. volleyball going to milwaukee so they were wow. i mean they were running up and backs dude it was it was nuts so when we think about that like let's talk about the education piece because i think it's really interesting and unique and you know we obviously have a really strong stance here on our education but we do talk a lot about why we why we like virtual education we think it allows for students one to engage in the platform like they've grown up with now they've grown up with smartphones they've grown up with youtube instagram netflix tiktok but also you can focus more on sports theater music whatever your extracurricular are because you can learn so much through that and you talk about how you maybe weren't the most engaged in school but you obviously are incredibly articulate really intellectually driven you learned a lot of that playing sports, the locker room banter. You know, can you talk about how hockey was its own education, your own right, and how you potentially maybe even learn more from your hockey experiences than your school experiences? Yeah, I mean, I think hockey is a school of hard knocks. When you're, especially <laughs> when you're walking in, it's like you're a fresh bait and yes. going into a jail, right? You don't want to end up like Tracy Morgan in Longest Yard, right, where you got the crop top on. So I would go in there, and you know, especially with older guys, you got to get acclimated, you got to be quick, and what is the best way to do that? Well, it's to be funny and somewhat smart, right? Yes. Like you don't want to be – I was never – I want to be like the idiot, just like no. the one's like the punching bag, right? Yep. In a locker room, that can happen quickly. It, it so can, yeah. I would always try to – whether it was, you know, if I was 15 playing with U18 guys or if I was a freshman 
playing with seniors in college. Playing juniors. You were you're really young to play juniors. juniors yeah. Or even playing pro. I always wanted to hang out with the older guys because I felt like they had more wisdom and more knowledge. And that would give me an ability to learn quicker. They always knew the good spots in town. They knew where the restaurants were. They knew where the nightclubs were. They knew where the chicks probably hung out, where to get a coffee. All that stuff came into play. And I always would try to gravitate towards the older guys, the veterans. And, you know, and then that way, by the time it was the following year, well, now I was, you know, I had that, like my, my speed was so much quicker and I had that, that much more knowledge. And, you know, it's kind of like graduating to the next level. sort of. Thing. Yeah. So then that's something that we talk about. Like you can learn so much from mentors, surrounding yourself with excellence. And that one-on-one small group time, that's where you really get the most impactful learning. And so like when you're with an older, is there anyone you want to shout out? Any mentor to you? I think a guy like in, in pro would be like, you know, Chris Butler, I would say, um, even Scotty Upshaw, who does his podcast. Yeah, I saw. Now, so I was, was, I was preparing for this yeah. call today and was watching your missing curfew with you and uh, Heat Daddy. Yeah. And that was a good, you had a good sweat suit on. Yeah, well, that was a velour, by the yeah. way. Yeah, that looked Perfect. amazing. Yeah, yeah. It, was a, it was Adidas velour. But, yeah, I just think, like, guy Alex Steen, a guy in St. Louis. Like, Great player. The, yeah, like, you know, I was a pigeon at the time and a young kid, but, you know, he would have me over for Thanksgiving or go grab something to eat. You know, just, like, lunches and, and just being, like, just a sponge. I know it sounds cliche, but, like, there's a re- like the older guys and th- there's a lot of knowledge that can be passed I'll along. Learn as much as possible. Exactly. When you think about uh, when you were your time in the NHL, just curiously, like, what do you think was the biggest gap between you making it for 10 plus years? I, again, I can't trust enough. And I think I texted you this uh, last year around the winter holiday. I think you're doing exactly what you're meant to be doing in life. You are so talented. I think you're going to go way farther than anybody can imagine. And so everything happens for a reason. But do you think is again, like I think about for myself, even I got a lot of humble pie on the development team, and that's why I moved to baseball. Um, there's always a, a reckoning with your own skill set. Mm-hmm. Do you think it was you didn't have the right coaches behind you? You you know really didn't want to commit to like what was the biggest gap? Yeah, you I, say? I think I ran into a log jam in St. Louis where if Agreed. I was was somewhere was else, and I had a little bit more of a runway to be the player that I could have been. You know, with using my skills, being an offensive defenseman, being a yes. quarterback of a power play, probably lacking a little bit defensively, but also making up for it on the offensive end. So now I, I try to go into a lineup like that in St. Louis, and you become, you know, you will go from prospect to suspect pretty quick <laughs> because now I got to play a role where I'm playing no power play. Yep. I'm asked to Hockey's block. all about power play. Right. That's what people don't realize, and that's yep. one thing I like had affinity to baseball for. At that, I, I had a tough time picking, and that's so why I kept switching. But like hockey, baseball, if you're hitting ninth, you're still up to bat. Yeah. Whereas hockey, if you're not on the top six forwards or on the top four D, you're kind of in a tough right. Place. And I, I just think I had a hard time adjusting from being a top four defensive my whole top life. Two. Probably, probably you're a top, top two. Top two always. Top two, but not two. <laughs> and, yeah. and going from a five six role where you're yeah. playing ten minutes instead of thirty minutes, yeah. in all situations, you're asked to block shots, you're asked to maybe fight or get out of your element, uh, play a hard nosed game. It's like I wear velour jumpsuits. Yes. But, do you see any five, six, seven defensive wear velour jumpsuits? No, and then there was a clash a little bit with that, just like personality wise. Because I think if you have a louder personality, you got to be a star. Yeah, you yeah. got to be a star, right? Especially in hockey at that Agreed. time in a very buttoned up organization and very traditional organization that Doug Armstrong does run there, right? He wants a guy that wears the the, the khakis, doesn't say a word, five, six defenseman, put him out there, you know, polo by Ralph Lauren shirts, like. That ain't me, baby. That's so I think I had a little bit of an identity crisis of, you know, I, I probably could have switched my game earlier to realize, like, fuck, this is what it's going to take me to get in the lineup, and then I can, you know, become the player that I want to be. But I just wanted the keys right away. I love so that. the thing is, is I think if I would have realized that and then maybe had a little bit more luck with coaching or situations, like, you know, every guy would say, it probably would have worked out differently. But, you know what? That's the, that's the game. No, maybe. things so, have worked you know. out really well for you. And I, you did get to have some adventures in Europe before retiring. Can you talk about what you thought about your European experience, especially contrasted with the AHL? So for those of you that are new to hockey listening, the AHL is the league that feeds into the NHL. It's equivalent to AAA for baseball, although people make pretty decent money there, whereas AAA baseball, you're making like ten grand a year. Most AHL guys making at least 70, 80 K and some are even making 400 grand, depending on what their status with the NHL team. Jordan went overseas and he played in Finland, Italy, and Switzerland. There yeah, are... Finland and Switzerland. Finland and Switzerland. Yeah. And so these leagues are probably, you, you, you tell us, like, were they as good hockey wise as the AHL? what do you think of the For fan sure. experience versus the AHL? what do you think of the lifestyle versus the AHL? Just curious out there because most people listening 
to know like it's so hard to make NHL, MLB, NFL, M NBA. And if you're an athlete and lucky enough to even play in the minors, you should really consider playing in Europe or for baseball in Asia because the overseas experience might be better than playing minor leagues here. I don't know. What do you think? I think so. I think you just kind of you run into a, a roadblock of you get to be 27, 28, 29, and you become an AHL veteran and you're playing behind, you know, Johnny, who was the 2023rd fourth round pick. Yep. He sucks, but he's going to play. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Some he's scout young. vouch yeah. for him yeah. up in Alberta. Fuck, this guy's going to be a player. He just needs minutes. And then four years go by, and Johnny's in the East Coast, or he's not playing anymore. So <laughs> you get into this space of it's a weird spot, and there's a very like a very minimal little space for these veterans of the AHL to play. So a lot of guys have to go overseas. And for me, I mean, it's awesome. I thought Finland, like, it was unbelievable. We get 8,500 fans per game. Even in Switzerland, the crowds are great. You can make good money. The crowds are like a European soccer, like, you know, feel. I mean, in Switzerland, they had the flares going out. Like, there's oh, fires going on in the arena. It's like, guys, this is an enclosed stadium. What the hell's going on here? Don't call the fire department, baby. It's getting hot in here. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it was good, man. Like, Finland, I, I love the country of Finland. I love the people there. Switzerland was great, too. I just was dealing with a head injury a little bit yeah. there. So, that was tough. But, man, Finland that year, especially with the whole city of Helsinki kind of rallying around that team. It was awesome, and I, I had a, a great time, and those people there are, are amazing. And, yeah, man, I, I think, like, any guy that's kind of just, like, in a rut or, like, you know, doesn't know if he should still ride it out in the AHL, like, dude, go play overseas. And besides the fact that the sun goes down in Helsinki at about 2 p.m. for about six months of the year, and you're looking at your phone, and you're like, can I go to the bar yet? Because uh, it's dark out. Other than that, it's pretty good. You know, just bring your, some, your red light kit. And, uh, you know, maybe a couple side pieces to keep you happy, and that's about all you need. Uh, that's a really good perspective. So I want to have a comment on one of your podcasts. You talked about education um, and, like, some of your views. And so you talked about, uh, you know, virtual education. Uh, you aren't able to go to class and meet people as much. I think the term you used was scout. Can you talk yeah. about why you really feel that way? And then also I want to contrast it with, you know, you – did go to probably, what, four schools in three years? Because you went to Verona, Sioux City, then where to you go, Ashwaubenon? Or per I went, yeah, I went, well, I went to two schools in Sioux City. I got basically told to leave a Catholic school. Um, <laughs> okay, so this is good. So wait, let's start on the first point about the non-virtual education sport, and then I want to contrast it with yeah. how many, how yeah. it could have. Uh, and then yeah. I ended up at a, an online school, University, oh, of, so, oh. University of Nebraska Lincoln Online. Fantastic. This is amazing segue. Okay, let's go. So that's first, where my, that's where I graduated from. I think it was me and four other people: Monty Teo's girlfriend, me, <laughs> two other guys. Well, so think about that. Like, how boring was it? Oh man, it was it was so boring. Yeah. It was, was it mostly like uh, packets or reading virtually? Like, well, talk about your online experience. Well, I, and I, why I, you ended up hating it? I, I just think for me, like, I was playing hockey in green bay i actually kind of forgot i was in school like i would have to do this certain amount of stuff to get to the point but then i remember looking up and i was like fuck it's may we're in the clerk cup i gotta graduate i got half the year to do so i basically <laughs> crammed in like half a year in like six weeks to finish it because it was so goddamn boring <laughs> and i just kind of forgot about it there's no real time frame other than you had to be finished by like july 1 i think yep. it was to, to the clearing house ncaa clearing yeah house. so i got that done but yeah man it was it was just like i mean it, it felt like i was taking drivers at it. i'm sitting there like i wasn't smoking cigarettes at the time but i'm like fuck uncle like just let's get this over with you know oh it's pure uh you know the the old player that's why we call ourselves netflix of education because we truly believe the old players although you'd probably say it's even blockbuster was better than that and i hope so but um all these old legacy players they were the first movers in online education uh, nebraska is one of them yeah. uh and they kind of cornered the market but they had no competition and so what we're really trying to do is bring like premium like like you're watching a netflix documentary but getting yeah. actual high school credit right. for it that's our goal and really help athletes like yourself who have a dream of playing we just had the eighth overall nba draft pick rob dillingham a couple weeks ago okay. really proud of that yeah. Um, we're working right now. Uh, long, do you remember John Hall? J yes, Holly. So, yeah, we're taking over their online the school. Goals. Yeah, yeah. No way. <laughs> long Island goals. Okay, uh, it's sweet. like one of the best uh, youth. Uh, I'd probably say them in the mission of the top youth. Uh, so he's triple. out in Long Island. He's actually in Illinois, but manages this, the. He's the president of Long Island, but he okay. lives in Wheaton, Illinois. But okay. we're taking over that program. Um, we're hopefully closing. If we just took over the World Champion Center, it's a. 
uh, Gymnastics Academy where Simone Biles went. Yep. And so these athletes, they want more flexibility, and we want them to be able to focus on their craft more. I actually had no idea that you even did online school. So why did you get kicked out of the school in Sioux City? Well, they were, they were like, really strict. You know, I would show up, and I was – 16 years old a junior at the time and my outfit would all be all in place we'd get back from a road trip at like four in the morning from tri-city and i'd have like the wrong colored shirt on like fella like, why are they putting you in a private school though? i think there was like some problems going on at one of the public schools so it was just you know a mess that year as a transition year they didn't know if they wanted to go to the sioux city east or this bishop healing school man i remember like one of the nuns like it would have to meet twice where they would drag me out of class and they'd bring me to the principal's office and they'd be like you need to shave. So they, I would go in there and they make me dry shave my face. Oh, that would and hurt. It would hurt. And then I would go back to school. And then sometimes like if I was late for a class or like, you need to come in on Saturday. I'm like, I have a game on Saturday. Like, no, like we're taking your phone. You come in on Saturday. Like guy, no, that's not how this works. So I like ended up having to have my coach, like, you know, get involved and, and call the school. And then I was just like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm out of here. So I ended up going to a, a different school, Sioux city East. And that was hilarious too. I think I was, uh, you know, I was a minority in, in the sense of, like, just, you know, I, like, that school, like, I don't even think they took roll call. You just show up whenever you want. It was like a picnic. You know? <laughs> so I think I went, I went, like, five times. But, you know, it is what it is. We well, can and, that out. Can, no, 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 not, no. And I think, no, I think that that's actually something we talk a lot about education is that um, your zip code determines your education so much, whether it's the public school you go to or how wealthy your family is. It really affects what type of educational experience you have. And that's what we're trying to fight is that, hey, no matter where you are, you can have an incredible experience because subjects here to help. So we're really trying to do that. But can we actually talk about a really cool story? As a, as a you know a young man, you actually got traded and had to move cities. Did you demand the trade, or how did that go down? Yeah, that's, that's you know it's, it's time. You know, yeah. let's go win. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So how did you do that? Like, how did you have the? Did you have your agent do it? Did you do it? Like, talk about uh, demanding a trade because I think a lot of the fans out there would be interested to know because we don't have insight, <laughs> uh, you know, conversational access to the Kevin Durant's of the world, but we do with Jay Swish right now. Yeah, so that was it was my draft year, Mike, as you remember, and yep. the new coach had come in, Luke Strand, the year before. I loved him. Strander still coaches right now at Mankato. So if, I don't know if he'll be watching this, but he's an awesome guy. So he was coaching Sioux City. He ended up getting fired, and they brought in Brett. Early Larkin, in the year? Uh, in the offseason. Oh, in the offseason. Yeah, okay, off so you knew. Right. So going in the year, like, yeah, I, and I was like, coach. okay, I'll try it out. They're bringing in this new guy, Brett Larson. He'd, be a, he'd been at uh, University of Minnesota Duluth. He's actually the head coach of St. Cloud State. He's actually a good guy, and we've actually had – you know, a beer talking about this. It was pretty funny. I saw him randomly like two years ago at a place in Wyzetta, Minnesota. So I'm going to that season and, you know, we're, we're having a tough start. The team's not great. It's whatever. I'm like looking at this power play. I'm like, this guy's got two backhands. That's my net front guy. Who's going to get me the pill? You know, so I, we, I played about 10 games and then I went to that junior A challenge. If you remember yeah, that the, tournament. the, the tournament where they, uh, it's basically like a, uh, it's like, similar to World Juniors, but just a tier down. Yeah, it's right? like yeah. U19 or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So you go to that before the World Juniors if you're going to play in that tournament. And yep. it was up in British Columbia. And I'm on the power play. I'm massaging the pill with, like, yeah. Alex Broadhurst, who's a Chicago Yeah, guy. great guy, yeah. Sam Hare, Nolan Laporte. Yeah, great guy. All these guys play on Green Bay. Andy Wilinski, yeah. who's yes. playing NHL game. Dakota Mermis, NHL yeah, player. That team was unbelievable. One of so, the best U.S. Angels teams of all time. I'm playing on this team, and the head coach is Derek Lalonde, who was the coach of Green Bay at the time, now the coach of the Detroit Red Wings, is the head coach. I'm sitting wow. there, like, and I'm playing top of the key, and we're, we're doing pretty well. I'm like, fuck, well, if I can go play with some of these guys, what are Ooh. we doing? So I pick up the phone and, you know, go full Rod Tidwell with it. Jerry Maguire, call my agent. I'm saying, give me the Green Bay or Dubuque, you know, and hang up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it ends up kind of working out where it's like, you know, this is the only places he'll go is, you know, if the deal is going to happen, right? If not, I'll stay put. If these teams have interest, Dubuque or Green Bay, both close to home, both really good teams. Dubuque had won the year prior. They'd beat Green Bay. Green Bay had obviously won a couple of years prior with John Cooper, who was the coach of the Tampa Bay Lightning. Yeah, great coach. So I orchestrated in the sense of, okay, if you can get me to these two spots, I'll have my shit packed and I'll be out of here tomorrow. So they blockbuster up this deal of like five or six guys. Yeah, who do you get traded for? A couple for? picks. It was David Goodwin, who was pretty nasty He's a good time. player, yeah. Alex Wilcox, the starting goalie. Um, I think it was two other players who were just like kind of just mid-level players. I think it was a first-round pick, maybe two first-round <laughs> picks, two seconds, and a seven. So a I good packed, haul. So I packed my shit so quick. I went to Green Bay, and that, that year couldn't have worked out any better. We obviously had a great team. 
and I was able to play in a role of that benefited me. Like we still had really good players. Like I didn't have to play 40 minutes a night, yep. right? We had Andy Walensky was back there, Great from Burmis, like a lot of good players. So I was able to slide in. I think it honestly took a lot of the pressure off of me where I could just go in there and, and you know, be AI with the rock and, you know, and facilitate the, the puck and, and be a pretty good piece for them and run the power play. And we ended up winning it that year. And, Unbelievable! You know, you're, got you're drafted, but yeah, first that's, round pick. And yeah. so then talk about your brother because he, similar to you, super talented first round pick, still in the NHL today. I think he's on an eight by eight contract right now, right? Or yeah, he was. He signed seven years at just under six. I think okay, seven by six. I gave him a couple yeah. <laughs> extra points, but uh, great stuff for Nick. Awesome guy. Um, underpaid still. Yeah, underpaid. <laughs> we want out from Utah Hockey Club. We got to yep. pay that guy more. He had a chance for sure to go to the development team and you guys steered him to green bay yep. i'm sure it was great to get to play with you which is awesome but that was really just for 10 games or so yep. why did he choose to do and it obviously turned out to be the right choice for him but why did he choose green bay over the development team well i they cut me so there's a little vendetta out there <laughs> right and well, of course, also, let's have the honest truth out here That's, yeah you know, and i also it. told him those you know i mean there's a lot of those guys are nerds like you don't want to yeah. be hanging with them. you're a green bay guy yeah you know just you're a ushl guy but i think he had just had that, you know, negative connotation around the program because they let the older brother go. You know, I thought that was kind of actually the reason why, really. I think he just, you know, felt some kind of way where he's like, you know what, I'm going to, I want to follow what Jordan did. The, my, you know, he's my older brother. I played 10 games this year. I think this will be a great path for me to. Closer to home. I won't have to take a back seat to anyone. Yep. You know, there's a lot of good players at the U.S. program. I completely, I mean, I think that was really what derailed my career. And again, that didn't go nearly as far as you is that the USA program is amazing and it's a huge honor and so cool. But if you're bought, like I was the worst player on the team and you're bottom forward versus being a first line player on a USHL team, I think it's actually much better for your development and your confidence. And once you lose your yes. confidence, it's really hard to maintain it. And so I just always thought that was really unique how you guys uh, really championed his career path, and look how great he's done. He's done amazing, and that was clearly the right choice. <laughs> yeah, that I, time. I think I remember that. Remember that Peter Ward, who was like the head scout yeah. of the of the team there. I think he was calling Nick, and he was just looking. He's like, oh, put that thing on dry ice, you know. I don't, well, what's like, crazy I'm not, is I'm not going. You know, arguably the best youth hockey team in history, the '96 Chicago Mission team. Nick Schmaltz, first round pick. William Nylander, first round pick. Christian Dvorak, first round pick. None of them played on the development team. No, no, that that team was so good, man. I was looking at those stats the other day. I was like, they they all had like 160 points in like 50 games. It was. I remember one game they they beat it. They whacked a team. I forget who it was. It was, I think it was 15 to one. Nick had one in 12 or one in 13, and Willie had like nine G's and four apples. Like it was just insane. Oh my god! Like goodness. they were just they were unbelievable. Well, I'm a huge Willie Nylander fan. I love the Leafs. I actually went uh, to Game Six this year where he had two goals. Unbelievable performance. Uh, huge, awesome Matthews fan. I like what you're saying about championing the game and bringing bigger personalities to hockey. I feel like both Austin and Willie are probably arguably the two biggest personalities in hockey. Yep. And we need to see more of that. Show your personality. Be yourself. This no commentary does not do anything for growing the game. And if you want to do what's best for hockey, it's to grow the game, get more followers. Social media is so important. Look at this guy. He's been able to big such build such a great following. And now people, Willie Nylander in the Amazon show that's coming out is rocking the butter golf hat. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Bay Matz is a friend of the show. He's a big butter golf guy. Those guys love it, man. Yeah, it's it's cool to see that they, you know, repping the brand. and It's amazing. What, yeah. what you've accomplished is so impressive, man, and I'm such a huge fan. And I think the biggest thing I'd love to be able to tie the episode with is if you were able to go back and speak to your high school version of yourself, uh, maybe before the private school version, <laughs> what would you tell yourself about life and why? And how can we be able to speak to some of the future student athletes into the camera right now? I just think be yourself. Like it's again, I've said it cliched the word in the, earlier in the episode, but I, I think like the, the world is missing like a lot of authenticity. Agreed. And just being you, and and then kind of just finding whatever that avenue is to who you are, and and then double down on that thing, baby. You know, like I, I think at times, like I even in hockey or whatever it was, um, you know, you would question what people thought of you, or just outside views of what people think you should be, or you know, they're always everyone's always quick to give out advice right yeah. they're always quick to you know give you what you should do or they they think you should do where it's like buddy i know what i'm doing you know what i mean and then at the same time 
trust the people that the words and the advice that you do have in that small circle of okay well, i can go to this guy if i need something over here or maybe it's your dad or your mom for this like have that little network of people you can reach to but at the same time man like you got to climb that mountain yourself and, and just you know keep going and, and pushing i think would be the biggest thing yeah i completely agree i think we talked about even running a company like we really rely on our board members and the people of that uh, vet vested interest in your success and similar to what he's calling out here is you know your parents your best friends and maybe a coach but once you get out of that fray and you're listening to you know twitter trolls and whatnot that's a distraction that's noise and i have no time for that and you know i'm so appreciative of your comedy and entertainment i'm a huge fan i'm going to continue to follow you very closely and i hope that we're able to return the favor and continue to do these pods together because it's a really enjoyable time getting to catch up with you and really excited for you yeah. man and this is another episode of On the Subject. I'm your host, Michael Blardo. We had Jay Switch today, unbelievable character. I really hope he's a return guest because his level of articulation entertainment is next level. And remember, we have to get our followers up. Find us on Spotify and YouTube. Those are the two platforms we're promoting. Click below, click like, click subscribe, and engage with us because we'd love to be able to get more incredible guests like Jay Switch, the people's insider right here. Thank you so much for your time today, Jay Swish. Hey, man. Always a pleasure. I'll shake you with the mitts on.